Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining. Welcome to the Wolf SSL Live webinar, DTLS 1.3 training presented by Wolf SSL, Wolf SSL software developer, Marco. My name is Cameron, and I will be moderating the webinar. All attendees will be in listed mode only. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A box, and we will host a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. The webinar will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel, channel shortly after the webinar. Um, I invite you to follow us on Twitter, X at WolfSSL, as well as our other social media platforms. Also, feel free to email us if you do have any additional questions. And now to give a brief overview before we move into the technical presentation. Today, Wolf SSL secures over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and dozens of resellers. Wolf SSL is made up over, of over 50 dedicated employees, most of which who are engineers. This progress is, of course, supported by a strong partner network that we're extremely proud of. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products, including WolfCrypt with DO178 support, FIPS certification, and a FIPS-ready offering, MQTT up to the V5 specification, SSH V2, TPM 2.0, and a secure bootloader known as WolfBoot, as well as Java wrappers and JSSE support, and commercial support for curl. All of these offerings are accompanied by thorough maintenance and support plans up to the 24-7 level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I'd like to turn it over to Marco to talk about DTLS 1.3 training. Okay, hello everybody. Good morning, I'm Marco Liberio. And as <clears throat> I was introduced, thank you for the introduction. I'm a Wolf SSL engineer uh, for more than two years at Wolf SSL. One of my main tasks was to develop the latest version of the Datagram Transport Layer Security, version 1.3, DTLS version 1.3. That is the main subject of this training session. So uh, just one sentence, what is what, what DTLS? Is. So DTLS is an easy way to provide communication security to application that communicate using Datagram-based protocols. So if you're already familiar with TLS, we can say that DTLS is for UDP, what TLS is for TCP. So let's see uh, uh, what, what the agenda of today. So we will first introduce the, some basic for DTLS, uh, why, why it's needed and uh, its trade-off. Then we got over some comparison of the this latest version with the, the 1.3 version versus the 1.2. After that, we are switching to code and then we will see how to use Wolf SSL DTLS implementation to secure very basic UDP client and server application. After that, we will have a Q&A session. So let's start from the, from the basic. So wh why, why we need the DTLS in the first place? Why we can't just use TLS protocol? So the TLS protocol, it requires a reliable and ordered communication channel. That means that it requires a communication channel uh, where every message that it's sent is received on the other end. And also the order of the message sent needs to be preserved on the receiving end. Usually it's TCP protocol that gives the guarantees to the TLS layer. What's the problem? The problem is that TCP has to do a lot of housekeeping to provide these guarantees. It has to do some buffering, some reordering. It has to use explicit acknowledgement to be sure that the message are really uh, delivered. And all this housekeeping, of course, incur in different types of overhead, especially latency overhead, bandwidth, lever uh, bandwidth overhead, but also footprint overhead. I mean, in the code size, so maintenance of the code overhead or uh, uh, simply memory overhead because of the complexity of the code. And while there are, there are a lot of applications that they can tolerate some missing of some packets from time to time, or they can tolerate the reordering of some message, but they can, it can really, um, can really sustain this latency bandwidth or footprint over it. Some example of this kind of application are uh, real-time uh, streaming, voice, and 
video streaming, uh, online gaming, battery powered device that they want to sleep for a long time. And then they, when they want to wake up, they want to really save as much power as possible. So they want to send as little bytes as possible to save power in the communication or other types of resource constrained device. So the, the, what's DTLS? So then why DTLS? So the TLS is just trying to modify the TLS layer uh, to a mini, with a minimal delta. So it can be used also over datagram protocol. And this has two very big advantage. It can reuse a well-established crypto system as the one as TLS. They said that are there already for many years. And also it, it can reuse most of the TLS implementation. So it's easier to uh, develop. But how DTLS can accomplish that? So to understand that, we have to understand uh, why TLS requires a reliable and ordered communication channel in the first place. So it requires a reliable because during the handshake, that is the first phase of, first phase of a TLS connection, where the parameter of the session get exchanged and then negotiated between the client and the server, of course, it's needed that all these messages need, uh, are delivered to the other part. Otherwise, the handshake cannot have place. And uh, on the other hand, it needs to, the message to be in order because um, in order to decrypt the stream of data, uh, I need always to know which part of the stream of data I'm decrypting at that moment. And this was implicit in TLS because all the stream is delivered and is delivered in order. So to accomplish the same thing, but in DTLS, in DTLS, we had retransmission and reordering for the handshake message. So we basically implement buffering, timing, and reordering, but just for the message of the handshake. And also we had explicit numbers, sequence number to the packet. So even if some application data can get lost or reordered, we can still decrypt the data. So just to, uh, um, it, it's important so to note that DTLS does not provide reliability or ordering for the application data. And this is obvious, otherwise we will incur in the same overhead of TCP. So ju just to do a brief recap, when DTLS is a good idea, when, you have, when I have uh, some application that uh, cannot afford any latency over it, that it's very constraining in the resource they have, so they want to save as much as bandwidth and uh, uh, energy as possible, and then they want to have the most simply, and they want to, to have the most lightweight protocol and design. Okay, so this is kind of a um, usual stack when we have uh, some sort of device that you collect some data some from sensor or you want to send some configuration. So this device usually frame this information in a proprietary protocol and then just frame this information with the UDP protocol and send that on the network. Of course, this is a completely unsafe communication. As we can see later, we can inspect the message and see all the messages, uh, the, the text is in clear, the, the data are in clear. So, and nowadays there is really not so much market for device of this type. So this is when DTLS comes, DTLS comes into the play. It will add authentication, confidentiality and integrity to, to the communication, meaning that you will be uh, you will authenticate the other peer. You, the message cannot be intercepted uh, from uh, uh, people that are looking at the, at the communication. And also it cannot be modified without getting notice. So it's also integrity protected. So now we will go over some difference between the latest DTLS version, the 1.3 and the older one, the 1.2. So first of all, DTLS 1.3 build on top of TLS 1.3. So all the improvement of TLS 1.3 over TLS 1.2 are also in it, in a, uh, add also in the DTLS one, version 1.3. In particular, it's a more modern, faster, and safer way of using cryptography. It's more modern because a lot of uh, old algos that uh, they're proven to be weak or um, to have um, attacks are completely removed for, from the protocol. 
And this is a list of the algos that they are removed. And it is also safer. Uh, it's, for example, it's removed the static key exchange mode from the protocol. This, this means that every time you go through, you do a new session, then a new ephemeral key will be created that it will be used only for that session. And this is important because you can protect us for a very simple kind of, let's say, attack where some, um, where the content of uh, uh, encrypted communication is accumulated over time and stored. And uh, even if cannot be, decrypted in that moment, uh, the adversary just hope that in the future, the private key will be compromised. And then after comp the key will, is compromised, then the, the data can be decrypted. It's important to state that there is still a way you can use the protocol that without losing this, uh, this property, but uh, it just, the, it is not, it, it's just a specific case. Uh, it's also more modern. I mean, uh, it's uh, I, I mm, the protocol provides both uh, um, integrity and confidentiality. These two operations are usually done in two uh, separate steps, but it it's uh, it's hard to doing it right when uh, doing that in two separate steps. So the more modern way of doing that. Is using uh, is doing that in a single operation, and this is what's called authenticated encryption with associated data, and this is the only cipher mode that can be used in 1.3 protocols, and we can see that we can use these three AAD mode. It's also safer because uh, more part of the handshake message are encrypted. Let's. Uh, Let's see on the left side, we see a typical uh, 1.2 uh, uh, TLS handshake. And you can see with the blue lines, which are the messages that are encrypted during the handshake. In 1.3 on the other side, you see that lot, uh, basically beside the client law and the server law, all the other messages in the handshake are also encrypted. And this allow for less inspection of uh, privacy related data and traffic analysis. It's also much faster than TLS 1.2, as you can see now. And this is because the handshake message were completely rearranged. Uh, as you see, let's take a look on, on the, the left side again for the 1.2. Then the client, hello, this is the typical handshake, the client, hello, the client sent a client hello and the server reply with this bunch of message server law certificate and so on and so on. And this is already a round trip, okay? This is already a message that go from the client to the server and a message from the server to the client. After that, the client need to send also some message like the client key exchange, et cetera, et cetera, and finish it. And the server needs to reply back with another set of message. So it's two round trip now. And only now you can start to send and communicate application data. On the other side, this is how a typical 1.3 handshake looks like. So the client send a client hello, but in the client hello, there's you already uh, the material to uh, agree on some shared uh, uh, crypto parameters for the session. So the server now reply with a bench message, not only the server hello, but also the other one. And this is yes, one, a one round trip. But after that, the client has to send some message, but they can also start to send application right away. So you see that the round trip time is halved. You can, and this is low the latency a lot. Even better, the server, uh, by sacrificing some property and some guarantees of the communication, can even start sending data before receiving the search to verify and finish the message from the client. Uh, even if it will not be sure about the authenticity of the client at that moment. So uh, we can even do even better when we are resuming or using a pre-shared key. So when we kind of already have the crypto material, we can start sending application encrypted application data in the first message with the client. 
uh, unfortunately, this data um, does not guarantee perfect forward security and are also kind of susceptible to um, replay attacks. These are improvements of 1.3 that uh, are, um, uh, are also in TLS 1.3, but there are also specific DTLS improvements. Um, first of all, message sequence number are now encrypted. And this is uh, allowed to protect us from some traffic analysis. The either was changed and now a super efficient either with uh, can be shrinked up, shrinked up to just two bytes can be used for the connection. So we have just two bytes of hover at every message. And uh, th they were introduced also explicit acknowledgement message. Uh, le let's see that with, with, uh, with an example. Here is the client is sending three message and for some error in the network, the second message gets lost. So in 1.2, the server will just start waiting. And at some point there is a timer, a timeout or a timer in the client that expires. And the client will resend all the three messages because the client hasn't any way to know which message are delivered and which are not. So now we have some explicit uh, acknowledgement message. So now the server can detect a disruption in the network and then just can just send uh, a message saying, I received the yellow and the blue message. So at this point, the client needs just to reply with the, with the message that, that were lost in the network communication. And uh, of course, the server can do that right away without waiting because it detects a disruption because there is no, there was a jump in the message sequence number. So the, the, the retransmission timer was shortcutted in the client side by this X message. And this means faster, faster and less bandwidth when there is the disruption, disruption in the network. This is some kind of artificial graph to show this property. And you see that the total bandwidth, bandwidth used when we are, were losing a packet and it's basically off of the bandwidth user with DTLS 1.3. Uh, there is also a very nice feature in DTLS 1.3. This feature is called connection ID. Basically, uh, when uh, I have um, a TLS or DTLS connection um, and I am in the server, when a, um, a datagram packet arrives, I usually use the EP address and, uh, and the port as a, as a way to uh, understand uh, which is the session where this packet belongs, okay? So if, um, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, some um, down, uh, unfortunately for some application, this is not ideal. ideal. Uh, the point is that there are some, long lasting IoT device that the user are under NAT, they, they really don't want to uh, spend time in doing new handshakes. So they want just to sleep and at some point wake up, send a message and go down. The problem is if the AP address change in this device, they have to do redo the, um, the handshake uh, because the AP address change. So the server cannot really know uh, which is the session uh, that this message belongs to. So they try to solve this problem using a label, a connection ID on every message. So this time we can use this label to multiplexing um, over the connection. It's also usable if uh, we have a single IP address that is shared among a lo lot of devices, so we can multiplex over a single IP address. And uh, this connection ID was a feature also of DTLS 1.2, but it was uh, separated in a, a separate RFC and now it's built in in the DTLS version 1.1.3 proto. So another small details about DTLS 1.3 and um, is that it unfortunately the UDP protocol are kind of more vulnerable to um, um, spoofing attack. That means that while in a TCP connection, you have to do an handshake, 
So uh, the application before using the TCP connection needs to wait the TCP connection to establish. So the two peers will uh, uh, exchange some message. U UDP is connectionless. So usually you just send a message and that one arrives. So it, it, it's easier to just put a fake EP address as a, the, the source uh, EP address on, this on the UDP message. And it will arrive to the application. Unfortunately, in a protocol that do a lot of work when they receive a message like DTLS, because it's doing a lot of cryptographic computation, this can open the door to denial of service attack. So because of that, DTLS 1.3 suggest to perform uh, what is called a return rotability check when it, and on, on the server side. This means that when the client send a client hello, the server does not go over and doing the handshake right away. But before that, it send an hello retry request that is a message already described in the TLS 1.3, and it has a cookie extension. A cookie extension is just a random number. And then, well, it's not a random number, but it, it, it's just a number for the client. From the point of view of the client, it's just a random number. And the client, at this point, it will reply with, with the same client hello, adding this number. And this way, the server it's, can be sure that at least the EP address, is some IP, ad, IP, uh, IP address where somebody re replied to. And uh, then it will continue with the rest of the end shake. And all these operations, there is a way and uh, the server can do all of these operations without maintaining any state. Uh, this is, is useful to defend against the of service attack. Okay, so with that, I end up with the slide. I would like to move on to uh, seeing some code. And uh, so I will switch over new window. Okay, this is just a um, fresh virtual machine with uh, uh, Ubuntu installed. Uh, so this way, this trend session will be kind of easier to follow. So let's first of all start install the prerequisite of uh, for this trend session. As you can see, there is build essential, uh, enterprise link, this is the tool chain, this is C, and et cetera. We'll install Git, so to just download um, our WolfSS of code. And then as we will use the configure script of WolfSL, we add some auto tools, the auto tools. And uh, to save some time, already started all of that. So we can now download our code. You can download our code either from the our web server, our web server, or our GitHub. So let's do it with that. Let's go over Wolf SSL. Uh, let's copy the Git address. Okay. Meanwhile, I prepared already two very basic examples of an UDP server and a UDP client. So let's start with the UDP with the UDP client. So uh, yeah, this is very basic. We are just uh, asking, uh, getting a port from the first argument of the command line. We create a socket. Please be aware that the socket is using um UDP. So it's a datagram based socket. We set up the address of the server. The address of the server for the transaction will be just localhost. And, um, and then we send a packet to the server. And after that we just try to receive a packet from the server and we close the socket. Really, really simple. On the server side, we do basically the same reverse order. We create a socket, and this time we bin, we bind the socket so it to the port given to the command line. 
So we are basically telling the operating, asking the operating system, every message, that a message over this port, just yes. um, pass over the socket number, socket participant number. And then we receive a, a message. So this will be the message received from the client. We'll be sure that is now terminated. We'll print the message and we send another message back. Uh, I also prepared a very minimal uh, make file. Uh, this will use it later, but we basically um, assuming that every C file is a single application so we can uh, do make file and compile all this, uh, do, do a make and compile all the uh, executable. So uh, let's see if this is working. So in the meantime, I cloned Wolf SSL. Our code is here instead. So I will run a make. Looks working. Uh, let me open a couple, another terminal. And then let's see, on one terminal, we open the server with the port 1224, and then we run all to the client. And uh, we see that we receive a message and sending another message back on the server side, and we send a message and receive another message on the client side. If you are going to analyze with a sniffer what is happening on the wire, Besides these messages that are not useful, we see that we have basically two messages, and we see that these messages are in clear. We can see in the data that there is the hello from client, and then that the server is replying back hello from server. Okay. Now that we have this basic starting point, we are going to. Uh, trying to add, use Wolf SSL to a DTLS 1.3 protocol to this simple um, client and server application. So let's open another terminal. Let's enter in the Wolf SSL director. And uh, you, this is the root folder. Um, you will find this small shell script. This was used just to uh, bootstrap the auto tools. So to, we will have the configure script and the make file and the the configure script to make the make file. So now we can use the configure script. And as you can see, the configure script, it's pretty huge. This is because our library is uh, built to be really modular. Every feature, almost every feature can be disabled. And this allow us to have a very minimal build in case of uh, our main target that are embedded devices. So what are the features we want to use in this session? So essentially will be enable DTLS and will be enable DTLS 1.3. So we are going to configure the library using that two option. And after the configure script, do this magic and then we are going to compile the library. Um, my computer is kind of low today. Uh, almost there. Okay, we can see that uh, that we can already run some tests to be sure that everything is working. You can see now all the algorithms that are compiled in were tested and also a simple TLS test. And, uh, and now we are going to modify our building and building make so we can compile using Wolf SSL. So we are going to use, we need to add 
these are just flags for the bagging. And then we add these include flags. This is where uh, we need to have our WolfSSL root folder inside the include path. Uh, why we are using this relative address and uh, we are pointing out and our in this directory. Uh, usually what you want to do at this time is doing simply make sudo make install to install it, to install the library system-wide. And this will install the library under user locally. And, but uh, I wanted to, this train session to be very self-contained. So we will use some little trick just to contain this build of the library inside this folder. And as we, our code is just one directory um, away, we're just refer using a relative uh, path. So we are going to add here the path of the library, the, the include path that is the root of the Wolf SSL uh, directory. And also we are going to um, tell the compiler where it can find our library. That using other tool, you can find the library in Wolf SSL SRC dot uh, libs, as you can see. Okay. We need also to enable the uh, as which uh, at this point, our compiling line will be something on the line of this. So dot leaves, and then we have like something ODP line the C. Uh, um, and this will uh, compile the, 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 the application using WolfSSL. Okay, so now that we solve this, let's create a new file. Um, let's call it DTLS plane, um, DTLS server. Let's start from the server. So first of all, to use WolfSSL, we need to include the headers when uh, we use uh, configuring script. The way we just did, we can include WolfSSL option.h. This would include the enable which that we passed on with configure script. And then as we are using the TLS stack, well, the DTLS stack, we are going to include the SSL H here. This is, of course, for historical reason as SSL was the older name for the TLS product. Okay, now I will try to go make this error going away. Uh, so we can have some nice competition that looks working. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, we need to initialize the, the library. So we will call this function that we need to call is WolfSSL init. Like most of WolfSSL API uh, success is indicated by returning WolfSSL success. So we are going to check for this return address. Okay, after that, we are going to create a context object. The context object will be um, an kind of, a, it will be an object that will store the common settings across all over SSL session. So this will include like the certificate. We also, we will also define if we want to be the server of the client and which protocol we want to use. All of these will be stored in the context. So to create a new context, I will just use WolfSSL context. No luck with competition today with new. 
Okay, what's the argument of the context? It's a method. A method is uh, another type in Walter Cell that is defining, uh, as I said before, which side we are using and which protocol we are using. So as we are using Wolf DTLS version 1.3, we are going to write this. And as we are going to be the server, we are going to use Wolf DTLS version 1.3 method. And we are going to check that uh, this allocation is uh, fail, double fail. Okay. Uh, after that, that we have created our context, we are the server. So of course the server needs to load both a certificate to show to the client for authentication and also needs to load the private key. When you compile with SSL this way with the configure script, it comes already with some test certificate that can be used for set testing. And they're all in the Wolf SSL shared directory. So I will just use this certificate and load that in the context. So first of all, I will do, use the API whose use certificate file. It takes the context, of course, and then the take part to the file. And again, I will use just to make things simpler, um, very simple. I will just use a relative path to the server, cert.pem. And then um, we need to also specify uh, what kind of type of file the certificate is stored. So it's spam. So now we, again, Let's check this is right, otherwise we can fail. Okay. And now we have to load again also the key. Uh, this the file, yes, it is. And file server key m. Let's copy this over. Okay, now we have done for this simple example with these settings that are globally shared across all these, all our SSL session. So now it's time to create, um, to start to create an SSL object instead. An SSL object is an object that in the Wolf SSL library just represents an SSL connection. And surprisingly, to create a new SSL object, you need to use Wolf SSL new. As a first argument, we will use the context. So again, we just check that we are okay with this. New allocation. Okay. Now, as you can see, the server will create a socket as before. It will bind the socket with the operating system. So now we have this socket that is running and uh, is uh, binded to the, to the port we are using. And at this point, we are going, instead of just receiving the message, as the DTLS requires an end shape, we're going to call Wolf SSL asset. This function will take care of 
taking the incoming message and negotiates the session. So it will go over the, the full and shake and, uh, and initiate and uh, negotiate all the crypto parameters. So again, we want to be sure that this is successfully Okay. And now if this instead of using receive from to receive row message we are already running here. Okay, before accepting, and just forgetting, very important thing, we need to tell the library which file descriptor we are using. So we are using WolfSSL set file descriptor just to tell the library that it can use this file descriptor to receive message. Um, Wolf's library, it's really uh, configurable. So what I'm just showing you is just the more simple example that will work on a, such a big system, such Linux, that we have POSIX and uh, file descriptor and socket and so on. All of these can be um, adapted to system where you don't have a full network stack or you have a user spec network stack like LW, double, LWIP or, um, or even uh, on a completely different medium because you can, instead of or, or using file descriptor, you can use in just callbacks. And uh, uh, if you give the library just an IO callback for reading and writing, more like uh, the read and write um, callback of policy callbacks, it can uh, it will run fine over that using that callback without worrying what we have down the stack. Okay, so now we we call accept. This will do the end shape, and at this point we can replace the clear text received, we can replace with the uh, Wolf SSL read. Let us take, just take the SSL object, the buffer, and the buffer set. And this point, I can just replace also send to the clear text send to with Wolf SSL write and I will just write the same. Before closing the sock, the socket it would be nice to just send an alert to the other peer if we want to close the connection gracefully. And then we are we take care of our memory, so we want to free the our object. Um, okay, that's all. We did all the code modification to a, a DTLS server. Let's check if this compiles. Uh, Of course, there are some warning. Uh, yes, I used the wrong second time today that this happened to me.
Okay, yes, we have an infinite variable. We can survive without that. Uh, so now we can run our DTLS server. Not yet, of course, because uh, as we didn't install our library system-wide, when we try to run our object, we the, the system cannot find the library. So we need to use kind of another small tweak to just be sure that the library is found. And now it can be run. Of course, we cannot use directly our UDP client with this with the server because the server will just ignore the message because it's not a client hello. But uh, if we go to our WolfSSL library, we can see that there is already an implementation, uh, a very nice client, example client that has lots of feature built in. So it will be a much more complicated example than the one we just saw, but you can do basically the same stuff and more. And uh, as an example, we use this as a client for our server and we'll pass by that we want to use the UDP socket. So we want to use DTLS. We want to use DTLS version 1.3. That does mean the min minus version four. And then we want to use port one, two, three, four. And then if we run this, we can see that the, D the UDP server received the message, hello of SSL, sending the message elephant server. And the client is a little bit more verbose, is reading out the version user DTLS 1.3, the cyber seat that this was negotiated, and the could be used for the, the, the shared secret generation, and then the message sent from us. This is a lot from server. We can just look at what happens on the wire. Oh no, because we stop it. We can start again. Um, now we can see that there was a client hello. And uh, we can see this is for legacy reason, this uh, version DTLS 1.2 in 1.2 protocol, the real version is in an extension. So you can find it here, but as you can see, uh, this is as unknown in Wireshark. This is because there isn't um, support for DTLS 1.3 in Wireshark yet. Uh, well, if you get the latest version of, DT of Wireshark, then you can see DTLS 1.3 here in the supported version field, but the, the rest of the protocol isn't supported yet. Uh, then the server, the server will send a server low. Again, this is due because uh, this is no uh, good support for DTLS 1.3. This is not a server low, it's an enlow retry request with the cookie extension. And you can see the cookie extension here that it's kind of a, a number. And now the client low will be again with the same number and now a, uh, the real server low, and these are packet already encrypted on the end of the shake. And as you can see, the message are encrypted. Okay, let's, uh, I think we have a couple of more minutes. Uh, we can just see how to do the same with some very shameless copy pass with the client to the, from the server to the client. Uh, yes, I'm using, I'm mixing up shortcuts, DTLS client. Um, we are going over some of the same step. We are going to create The context, this time we are not using server as a method, but client.
And also, instead of using Now, to make things simple, we I don't want to do um, client authentication, but the client needs to authenticate the server. So we need, instead of loading a certificate, we need to load the certificate location. Just open for a moment. Just forget the name over. Uh, location. And this will take the context, the path to a file. Oh, this is okay. uh, yeah, so, um, and then we want to. And this is just the directory where there is a file name as, as we use the full path there is not needed. Uh, perfect. And then we are going to. So from here, when we create the socket and so on and so on, at this point we can We will set EFD. Okay, I will not do the error checking because we are in a hurry. Uh, but now there is a difference because uh, the socket has no information about which is the server because we the socket is a connectionless. So there are a couple of ways to overcome this, but we'll just use a DTLS um, way of solving this issue by setting the peer using the, the function WolfSSL DTLS set peer. So I'm going to go over uh, what the server address to the WolfSSL. And at this point, of course, I have to establish to do the handshake. So instead of using accept, like in the server, we will use connect. We'd like to do just here some error checking. And now we can, again, just Use Wolf as a wide. And review by using Okay, we can now try this. This is the wrong director directory. Um there's some sort of things with this today. Not sure why. I keep doing that. Okay, I can 
Yeah, maybe I switch it over for the fun. Okay, we need to create the SSL object. Did I forget about do that? Of course. Okay, now we can survive without this and then we'll see the SSL server. Uh, we we'll try out the TL. There we go. And with this, uh, I end up the training session. And uh, I would like to hope to have some time from some Q and A. Awesome. Hey, thank you, Marcos, for Marco for running through that. Um, that was a helpful demo for a lot of individuals. Uh, I do, do have a lot of questions here. Go ahead and start from the top. Um, can DTLS be used for multicast UDP or only for unicast UDP? It, it can be used for multicast. We support multicast in the version 1.2. Uh, there is some work to do for making it work on 1.3. Awesome. Thank you. Um, can DTLS be safely added to new product design nowadays? How mature is it already or uh, and how wide support it has in the market with other vendors or when preparing design for DTLS developers should assume that firmware of both ends of communication line are over their complete control? Uh, okay, kind of a long question, of course. Of course. Uh, so DTLS, it's already in a lot of devices in the market. DTLS 1.3 is something quite new. Uh, actually, we are the only one we are developing that, but it, we, we think that it's really, uh, uh, it's really, uh, there are some really good improvements over, over the last version. So we, we think that the market should start adopting DTLS 1.3 much sooner, and much, and it can get so it can gain some um, it can get some quite good uh, improvement over the 1.2. Awesome. Um, how small minimal DTLS 1.3 packet can be? Can it be say only yeah, a header, just, which is two yeah, bytes? I think you can send just on either of two bytes. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, next, uh, will you share the recording? I missed the first 20 yeah. minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, we will send out an email uh, as soon as we get a copy of that, or you can check our YouTube channel. It'll be uploaded on there. Um, can DTLS 1.3 be applied with MQTT uh, yes, sensor of network? Course. Yes, of mm -hmm. course. Right. If it's uh, the already... it can be applied, and uh, uh, why I didn't try that right away, but I think it should be seamless to be supported in our both MQTT client. Awesome. Um, does DTLS support hardware PSK where it is not ex exportable? Hardware PSK. Um, I'm trying to understand the question. Are you saying that you want some PSK that is kind of stored in another software module and this PSK will never leave from the hardware support module? We, of course, support this kind of uh, things in the library because if we support the hardware support module, our library supports a lot of different hardware acceleration and uh, software and TPM and hardware HSM. So the point is that then the shared secret will be uh, computed by the HSM. So the shared secret will be exported, but not the PSK. I hope this answered the question if this is the this this was the question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> cool. Uh, next, uh, 
Can you send the commands in textual format, which you use during the demo? Uh, I can I can accompany the slide. I can modify the slide and add the command to compile and build the wall SSL. Uh, doing and and the final dot uh, c file, so you can use it. But uh, overall, um, let's go back on the slide just one moment and. Um, there is very other, much more example at this GitHub repo where you can find DTLS directory and you can find a lot of example, even more complete than the one I was doing right now. Awesome, thank you, Marco. Um, next, can you suggest any public server which can res respond DTLS 1.3 protocol for testing and prototyping purposes? I don't know any public server is use, that using DTLS at the moment, 1.3. Uh, you can use our example application if you want and just use localhost. Cool. Uh, can more than one server hold single UDP data pro, datagram port on a host or the restriction is the same as for a TCP IP? Uh, no, it did the same restriction. I mean, the kernel at some point, he has to decide who is going to deal with the packet. Of course, you can always pass the, uh, the packet on that port, or you can always build a chain and then you have kind of a single server and then this server will kind of branch over if you need to do multiple things in parallel with the same packet. Of course, you can, you can you can you can use connection ID to just have a server on a single port, and then the message that will be branched over the different session based on the connection ID. But really, there is one port. Thank you. Um, is there any RFC and IST recommendations which is followed by Wolf SSL for DTLS? Maybe for 1.2 implementation, considering various Same extensions extension and options. Option. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I know that there are some um, RFC that are for doing recommendation of use, for using DTLS in IoT constrained device. And uh, there is a draft for DTLS 1.3 that is working, that it's on, um, uh, that's a work in progress at the moment, but I'm not familiar with this RFC. I should have taken it this uh, offline, I'm sorry. Right, next, uh, how dependable is a uh, WolfSSL so, yes, source? With the version, please go ahead, sorry. So our library is completely um, independent on operating system or library on network stack. So what I showed today it was just a simple way to start coding with the with the with the library using Linux. But the uh, library is compatible with several different operating system and it can be run also on bare metal. The only thing that the really Wolf SSL TLS library needs is a couple of callbacks to write and read from the network. If you can provide these two callbacks, then it will be okay. And for building, it's just pure C. It does not depend on any POSIX. It does not depend. You can build without any libc, libc if you want. Then, of course, you need to provide some sort of wrappers and provide your own implementation of some of the function. Like in DTLS 1.3, unfortunately, we need malloc. So you have to provide your version of malloc at this time. But we also, um, I think I should test that. I think we also provide some sort of uh, mocked version of malloc that we'll use with huge array of memory. Already. Um, yes, we, we yeah. have a lot of testing. So the, the question is uh, if we have a set of testing to verify the protocol. Uh, so the library is Send, is written from scratch, but the library is old, all already for around already 
20 years now, we are talking about CSSL and WFSSL in general. Of course, there are there were multiple iteration of the protocol, and the 1.2 protocol of TLS is around uh, for some years now. Now we can start speaking about years, and the TLS is just a minimal delta to the TLS. But of course, we some parts are new, and we are out of test. We are running tests when we dropping packets. When test we are reordering packet. And all the tests are all open source, and you can find in the in the in the in the library. Unfortunately, we cannot do any interoperability tests because there is no other implementation around. Uh, I use just uh, C, C plus plus for Microsoft, and I use some Emacs K bindings and make file. Uh, this is just a very clean installation of Visual Code. And I just the, installed the plugin that they suggested me. It's not my usual editor. With, yeah, I mean, with this dyno of service or spoofing attack are really kind of far because you cannot really avoid them. So the, the thing you can try is that just to waste the minimal amount of resource uh, when we are not sure that you are talking with a legitimate uh, peer. Uh, we have a lot of uh, countermeasure built in. So we basically try as much as we can of doing less work as possible before getting a right cookie. Um, there are some situation when you have some trade-off to have to be made. Uh, like, if you want to enable resuming, there's a way so client can avoid doing all the re-end shake after, uh, after a successful connection to save time, you don't really want to do this cookie check. So we have kind of a build option that if this the resuming is correct, then you skip this return rotability check. Yeah, with, with, unfortunately, with denial of service, it's always a trade-off. It's never a full defense. But of course, you can use a lot of indication of attack on the server side. But these are really outside of the protocol. It's more like on the um, you can use other tools like firewall tool to detect dyno of service attack. Uh, yes, as I said before, it's compatible with a lot of different compiler. We try to stick to pure C, and it will run mostly everywhere, every architecture compiler and operating system. Uh, so even if the certificate is big and they will not fit in a maximum transmission unit, something that I maybe miss from the DTLS presentation is that DTLS also handle fragmentation. So uh, we can handle even post quantum in DTLS. There are quite huge uh, signatures. So it, if a certificate does not fit in uh, a message, it will just fragment it. Oh, Wolf DTL is part of Wolf SSL. No, Wolf DTL is part of Wolf SSL library. What do we have to consider a condition? Um, so you need some care about it. when we are doing real, real, real world scenario, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, the packet you are receiving because you have to kind of um, uh, fork and create every session for every peers that you receive. And sometimes you have to do some message picking to get the, the the address of the peer before creating the before doing the asset but moreover all the api used for tls 1.3 can be basically used on dtls there are some dtls specific things like this um, uh, resuming uh, avoid uh, um, the cookie when we are resuming or um, and but overall it's very, it, it's basically, uh, if you want to stick with the normal POSIX API, uh, the library will do everything itself. If you don't want more control about timeouts, then you 
will to create your timeout and tell a library when when you eat a timeout and you need to retransmit data. But it's a smaller thing. Mm. Not sure about this question. I should go over the code again, so I will skip this. Sorry. Uh, if some packets are dropped, uh, then the the tube the the peer will detect it and send a NAC message where it say which are the packets that it received. And, and so it can try to uh, progress in the end shake, transferring only the lost packet. Sometimes this is not, if you lose a, a full flight, of course, you, there is no other, the, then the, a timeout will, uh, will expire and you will resend the full flight. As a flight, as I mean, a full set of message from one side to the other. Uh, no, the certificate is the one that is shown to the client. To uh, the question is not clear where you need to configure both certificate and private key. So the certificate is the one that is shown to the client, and then the private key is used to obtain a cryptographic proof that you are the owner of the key of the certificate, and you have to use it because you have to sign the handshake using that private key. Yes, the null cipher, or just say, when you just want to uh, use the authenticity and integrity uh, property of the TTLS, but you don't want to encrypt the data because there are some use case like in uh, Ivionics uh, that you want integrity and uh, authenticity, but you want the data to be intercepted. It can be used and it's supported. Uh, they're really, yes, uh, what accept and connect are concepts similar to POSIX in some way because there is an end shake, so there is a session that's created. Uh, maybe uh, it's also some terminology that it's used in, maybe, but there are some analogies, so this is the API for now. Even with suggestion. And now the last question is, uh, very will will very short message we can increase on the key. Okay, so um short message shouldn't we can encryption as far as I know. But in TLS 1.3 you can always pad message and this is not for because the encryption is weaker, but because you can do traffic analysis. So if you don't want to um to leak the size of your message you should pad your message. And DTLS 1.3 allows you to pad the message. If the keys are changing during the long term, yes. So there is some suggestion in the RFC that we are honoring. So after if they, we, there is a specific type of end check message that are sent after we, the, the number of uh, times the key are used is too high. Uh, but of course, you can also proactively change key if you want. And uh, we have some API to do that as well. Okay, looks like we reply all the question. Um, so, so summary, DTLS, faster saving, cutting edge, full support. And um, please, if you have any more questions, just reach out at fact.wolfsl.com. <laughs>